So this is my first uh, Angkor Wat? Your first Angkor Wat, yes, this is it. I think one of the new yes, Buddha, yes, kan? This is your first Angkor Wat. The first one, the old party, 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 the old party. Yeah. It's my first thing. Rupa dia kayak Angkor Wat ni. Super juga. Dah lagi dahsyat lah. 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 Lagi dahsyat this is okay. you close up this is and man make structure menumpang nak dia ni nak 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 runtuh tak boleh pasal ada ni dia ni nak nak runtuh pun tak boleh pasal ada ni dia sudah ikat kan okay. and this is what i'm talk about yeah. my work where two element hmm. uh, the root of the tree going down deep into the earth to look for the water yeah and man-made object trying to reach up the sky. Yes. Transcend like a to to yes. to get to the highest level of spirit. Yeah. Yes. And this already there. 49. So, kita kan pada kampung, tiba-tiba yes. betul tu orang support. And this is my area. And I'm not so busy right now. Very soon. Yes. Ada ni lah tengok. Ada ni. Ha, sini kota perak. Sini ada kota perak kat sini. Itu dah kota raja tau. Tempat. Itu dah kota. Tempat. Apa ni? Tempat. 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 Kan, kita panggil tempat ni kota lah uh, Kan Lepas tu uh, Sini dulu ada kota perak uh, Kita orang buat kuda Asyik lah sampai pagi uh, So before I went to Jawa I've seen already yeah, really, 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 really. Kota perak uh, wayang, wayang orang kan Wayang orang Wayang orang Wayang orang This is the house Sini ada pelantar dulu dia buat Masuk sini dah Ini kampung lah Total uh, Istana Kampung Gelam eh? Kotan Gate, Singapura Itu dibuat kemudian lah Kot kan, tapi built in 1840 Yes Oh lama lah. Ini zaman Nusy Abdul lah. Kalau tak silap. Nusy Abdul orang jaga jadi ya. Yes. Dia yang dia takut ah. Ya kan. Ah ingat. Kita itu. Nak kat sini tak? Ni kita ke sana. Kita nak jaga tu.
Bukan kamu masuk kamu bau tak masuk eh? bau bau dia bau ah okey jadi ah jadi dia punya area ah dia lokom situlah dia lokom ah situlah dia ada dapur dan tangga ke atas ah sini ada pangkin lah pangkin semua ah ini semua terang bermanusia semua dia musim lah ini kalau musim pun berlomba Tak ada orang, dia boleh tak buat apa-apa Tak ada masa Kenapa agama is able to replica this world? Nanti baru ni, jalan ni yang Tahu, macam buat dari Apple Slash kan? Ha? Ha, ada yang pandai tukar ni Dia boleh buat macam mana yang lama, buat baru, itu yang baru That's new one Haa ini lama Ini dia nak ubah kan ke apa? Tak Mana? Okay. Tak 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 Good afternoon, everyone, and a great big hello to all of you. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Get up close with the curators, the artists, and the artist patrons. The Pago Pago Journey is a by-invite only program, and we're very privileged to have all of you joining us today. This session is being recorded and will be made available for public viewing in the near future. I'm Kola Liu, Director of Partnership Deliver Development at the Gallery, looking after our partners, donors, supporters, and members. I bid you all a warm welcome to today's sessions. Joining us physically today at the, at the Exhibition Gallery, where Pago Pago, the exhibition is featured, is Shabir Hussein Mustafa, or simply known as Mus, our senior curator and lead curator for the exhibition. Chairman of the gallery, Mr. Xia Fuhua, who today is joining us in the panel as a patron of the artist. Joining us online, firstly, is our featured artist for today, Pak Latif Mohidin. Hello, Pak Latif. Hi. He's joining us from his studio and home in Penang. Finally, we have Rahel Joseph, Gallery Director of Ilham Gallery in Kuala Lumpur, 
where Pago Pago, the exhibition, was presented in August to December of 2018. I would like to start today's sessions, if I may, by asking Moose to introduce Park Latif's early years in Singapore, where he was discovered as a child prodigy painter at a tender age of 12. His first exhibition was presented at Kota Raja Malay School, comprising of 60 artworks. <coughs> Park Latif's early works painted in Singapore is a unique feature of the Pago Pago exhibition presented at the gallery. They were not shown in the exhibitions in Centre Pompidou, nor at Ilham Gallery. To truly understand Pat Latif's dedication to a lifetime of practice, it is important for us to start the narrative at Kampong Glam in Singapore. After Mu's introduction of Pat Latif's early practice, which, which should provide us with the context for our panel discussion that follows, I will return to beginning the Get Up Close segment of the sessions. Moose, over to you. Thank you, Kola. I mean, I want to just begin by saying that this project has uh, entailed significant support and continues to receive support from um, our donors, uh, patrons, and also our lenders. Uh, many of whom are joining us today. So I just want to say thank you. Uh, you know, on behalf of Park Latif, the gallery, um, and everybody that's been involved so far. And uh, the project has also moved over the last two years from Paris to, to KL and now to Singapore. And uh, as Kola has mentioned, whilst the Paris and KL exhibition were, were quite critical uh, in terms of framing Park Latif's work from 1960 to 69, the exhibition in Singapore kind of picks up on an earlier chapter of his, of his life experience. And uh, Park Latif arrived in, in Singapore at the tender age of eight with his mother from Sremban. And, uh, and began to kind of discover this incredible city. In fact, he often says that it was his first brush with uh, cosmopolitanism, right? So to be in this world, but also to be between languages, to be between uh, cultures, and to kind of make that a very productive way of looking and thinking about art and literature and so on and so forth. So, so, so it's, it's, it's trying to kind of render the, the, the Pago Pago uh, works in a very complex way. And I, I think the complexity is important sometimes as well to understand what artists are doing and why they do certain things. And one of the key kind of sites within the Singapore years is Kampong Glam, the kind of historic neighborhood which was really at the center of the, of the Malay world. It was a place that connected different cultures, communities, and people, but it was also the site where uh, these different communities met. And uh, uh, of course, Park Latif's uh, father uh, used to own and operate a Hajj lodging, lodging house in, um, in, in, in Kampung Glam, and this, this lodging house was also where he lived and stayed. And uh, it was really quite fantastic because he, uh, in, in many ways, uh, began to uh, kind of experience this new world by talking to a lot of the lodgers and the passengers who would pass through. So, so to learn from the world is also a way to speak and connect with others. And it's also at this time, as Kola mentioned, uh, and this is a, a kind of a mythical story, but I'm going to repeat it nonetheless because it has been told many times. Uh, but Park Latif is very young, and one day uh, he, is, he and his classmates are told to make a painting, a still life painting. And the teacher in the class notices that, oh, this little boy can paint better than the rest of his classmates and begins to observe him. Uh, very soon they realize that he has a gift in his veins, and this gift is to paint. 
and uh, immediately you know he is discovered and 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 declared in the newspapers as a boy genius and 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 and, and a whole flurry of newspaper articles emerge and also he has his first solo exhibition at the Kotaraja Malay School. In fact, you can see this on the screen uh, at, this, at this moment, uh, the number of works that he, he produced. And of course, amidst all of this, he's being connected by not just uh, his teachers, but also key mentors. One of the figures that uh, we always recall, both of us, is Abdul Ghani Hamid, who becomes a key guide of this young artist as he's moving through the city, but also moving and, and, and entering the world of art, I suppose. And um, there is also uh, another aspect, uh, which is connected to his painting, which is Paglatif's kind of discovery of his mother. And uh, this is quite important, I think, uh, in this regard, uh, because his mother plays a very formative role uh, in his nurturing. And, 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 and there is this incredible image uh, that you are seeing on the screen at the moment with Park Latif's mother standing and uh, observing and conducting a, a sewing class um, at the very lodging house uh, that his father used to own uh, and operate. And I have a quotation from a book that we have produced specially for the Singapore uh, edition. And so please allow me to read Park Latif's words. Being a matriarch, she, as in Paglatif's mother, took great pride in cooking Minangkabau food and for a time set up a restaurant for the cuisine in Tanjampaga. However, her real talent was as a tailor, adept at hand sewing, embroidery, and making baju bandung. At one point during the off hut season, she converted my father's lodging house at 15 Java Road into a tailoring school. She had just received a certificate for embroidery from the Singer Manufacturing Company. Rows of rented sewing machines, you can see them here, were placed behind a counter where she stood and instructed form. Young women and widows from Kampung Glam came in as students. Among them were two promising actresses even from Jalan Ampas, who were also close relatives, Umi Khaltum and Rosnani Jamil. So in a sense, I think um, there is a kind of uh, the, the world of art, but it is also uh, kind of connecting you know, with one's parents, discovering their own identities, and then subsequently learning from that experience, uh, which this exhibition tries to, to get that. So uh, perhaps I can uh, uh, you know, pause here, but uh, just one last point. Uh, this book that we produced um, it will, is, is, is available, so if you do need a copy, just get in touch with us and we will post one to you. Uh, because we want to share this incredible story of this little boy uh, in Kampung Glam being discovered uh, as, as an artist. So, yes, Kola. Thank you, Moose, for the introduction. Uh, I'd also like to thank participants at this stage for sharing your thoughts in participating in the poll earlier on. We did ask three questions. Uh, a bit surprising, 35% um, of you are familiar with Park Latif's work in Singapore, and 70% are familiar with this Pago Pago series, and about 50% are familiar with his work post-1970. So uh, with that introduction from Moose, we shall begin the conversations with the curator, the artist, and the artist patrons. So let me first ask Moose a few questions. Moose, please share with us why Pago Pago, the exhibition, was presented first at Sante Pompidou and not premiered at the gallery in Singapore? Um, actually, the, the story of the Pago Pago exhibition, Kola, begins uh, much earlier than 2018. Uh, in fact, uh, it is connected to the first major uh, changing exhibition that the gallery organized in 2016 called Reframing Modernism. And uh, this project uh, was co-curated by colleagues from the gallery and uh, curatorial colleagues from the Pompidou Center. And in that exhibition, it surveyed uh, major currents within uh, European and Southeast Asian modern art as parallel trajectories. And uh, uh, Pag Latif's um, Pago Pago works were presented in that exhibition. And so in a sense, while that exhibition really sought to think about the breadth 
of, of, of modern art in, 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 in Southeast Asia and Europe. The Pago Pago exhibition then became an opportunity to look much deeper into a particular body of works uh, that emerged, right? And of course, uh, as we know, um, I'm not going to get into too much detail, but the Pago Pago works also very much uh, developed in conversation with major currents uh, that were operating in the 1960s in relation to modernism. And so uh, the, the, our colleagues at the Pompidou Center invited Pag Latif, and then we decided to collaborate uh, on this. And it was fantastic is that the exhibition was held really in the center of the, 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 the permanent galleries of uh, 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 the Centre Pompidou. And this became quite incredible because here we were presenting one of the most important bodies of work to emerge from Southeast Asian modern art in the center of the so-called Western canon. And I think this dialogue uh, and the number of dialogues that have emerged ever since, this is also something that uh, we are trying to still account for and understand, uh, to be honest. It's, it's a process. It's still ongoing. Well, you know, Park Latif was the first Southeast Asian artist to be presented alongside Sondre Pompidou permanent collection, as Moose has mentioned. So I shall ask Moose, what were your concerns and considerations as a curator to ensure that the audience in Paris who may not be familiar with the artist, you know, in sort of making sure that the show will be receptive. I think, um, I think this is the other aspect because we have relied on the generosity of our colleagues at the Pompidou Centre. And uh, in this regard, I really need to acknowledge uh, Catherine David. Uh, the chief curator at the Pompidou, who really became uh, very, very invested in this process, uh, not just from securing the space right in the center of the, of the permanent galleries, but also really working very closely with us in terms of how a lot of these materials could be translated for the Parisian public. So, you know, for instance, uh, the introduction of the extensive archival materials that are in the exhibition, also in this exhibition and at Ilham, these were very much developed in dialogue uh, with Catherine uh, during that time. And of course, you know, the other dimension that this project has started uh, or enabled right from the start are the public programs. So for instance, in, uh, in Paris, just a day after the exhibition opened, we convened a, uh, a gathering of poet poetic fellows where Park Latif and uh, his, uh, his, his friend uh, and, and ally uh, since the 1960s, uh, the wonderful Gunawan Mohamed, were in conversation with two other incredible thinkers, Terence Ward and Idana Pucci. And uh, I'm not going to get into the details because that session was more than two hours long. You can just imagine, right? But there is this fantastic moment where Park Latif and Gunawan Mohamed, they begin to switch between languages. So they would go from German to Spanish to Bahasa to, to, <laughs> to French uh, to English. And suddenly you realize that uh, you're, you're in a very special place. You know, you're in a very special position. And uh, you're not just a part of it, but you're actually facilitating it. And I think that, that's, uh, that was quite a pleasure, actually, from a curatorial point of view. Yeah. Thank you. The participant earlier on shared with us that 85% of you have actually already seen this exhibition at the gallery. And you once get to see the beautiful curation of the artworks in an exhibition of this nature. But very seldom do we get to hear from the curator point of view what goes into their thinking in presenting such an exhibition. So I shall now ask Moose, as a curator, how do you present the show to incorporate the research and the understanding of the artist's practice that you have discovered through your research and process? Yeah, so I mean, I think I've already mentioned this uh, earlier, Kola. I mean, one of the things that this exhibition does is working very closely with Park Latif, actually, in terms of really conducting an archaeology of his own archives. And Pai Latif has been so generous uh, in this regard. You know, he has guided the entire process. But there's also another method, I think, uh, that uh, perhaps is worth mentioning. And that is that uh, the process of this exhibition has also evolved very much in conversation with Pai Latif. 
And this is a kind of a rather unique and interesting process because we would meet almost every month sometimes and talk for two, three days nonstop. And these conversations would range, you know, from metaphysics to transcendentalism to modern art. And then, you know, a lot of these ideas are synthesized into the exhibition. So, for instance, even in this exhibition, since 85% of our attendees have seen it, um, it incorporates a lot of Paglati's writings. And it's, it's very selected. It's, 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 it's edited, you know. But this editorial process is developed through hundreds of hours of conversation to arrive at that one moment, you say. So I think it's this process uh, of conversation between, I think, artist, curator, and the institution as well, which is quite uh, intriguing and interesting, I think. Um, we need to move on to the other panelists. So one final question for Moose. I'm skipping the next one. So this one, I'm going to ask you, how is the exhibition at the gallery different than the one curated at Santo Pompidou? which was also jointly curated by you and Christine. Yeah, um, I, think, uh, I think it's, we already started this, and I, I'm, I'm sure Rahel will talk about this in a little while. Um, but one of the things that we in, started doing in the KL show, and it's been taken forward in this, in this version, is uh, the, we've introduced a very detailed timeline of Paglatif's activities from 1949 to 1969. And it's incredible the world uh, that opens up when you actually encounter this timeline. This timeline is also free to download from the Pago Pago microsite. So you can just go down and just click the PDF and it's there. Anybody can read it. It's free of charge. You know, there's, there's no uh, kind of obstacles uh, in accessing it. But also incorporating a number of films. Uh, we just watched a film earlier, um, uh, which is Paglatif wandering the uh, uh, Kampung Lam era in 1994 when he had an exhibition here, which was co -org uh, organized by the Sing Singapore Art Museum. But there's also other films like Kalau Kau Mahu, uh, which is uh, a film, it's called If You Will, which is a film which shows Paglatif <laughs> in his habit uh, during the 1960s and 70s as a wanderer. Uh, who is kind of going through and moving through landscape and space. It's quite an incredible film. So, so there's all these aspects. Uh, and these things have, they're also uh, available online. So uh, you can watch uh, uh, fragments of this film on the National Gallery's uh, YouTube channel. Uh, so you just go to the YouTube channel and you'll find it. It's pretty straightforward. Yeah. Thank you, Moose. We have heard from the curator and getting some insight into how he sort of decurated the exhibition. We shall now turn to Pak Latif, you know, for him to share a journey of his lifelong art practice. I hope some of the questions that I'm about to ask will, will pro provide some fresh perspective of Pak Latif's art practice, as they may be different than the kind of questions that's usually asked by curators, art historians, and academia. So, Pak Latif, I hope you can hear me well. Hi. Many in the audience you. knows you as an artist or the artist Latif Mohidin. Yet, in many of your earlier exhibition catalogs in the 60s and 70s, you were actually known at the artist, as the artist Abdul Latif. Can you share if there's any significance to the name change? Uh, well, uh, the adulative was chosen to be the, uh, my name, I have a long name, so they started when I was in Berlin. My, my name is too long for the, for the, for the, for the Germans, you know, so then they just called me Abdul. And, uh, and there were two or three paintings in that Abdul. And then I would, uh, and then later I would change to Abdul Latif. And then instead of Abdul Latif, I just go AL, initial, AL Abdul Latif. This is the second time I use the initial. Uh, you know, that, uh, the first time was when I was in Singapore. Uh, uh, and you observed quite a few paintings in the world in Singapore, the landscapes. The my nation was Alma, ALMT. Which means in really short form of Abdul Latif Mohidin artist. So Alma. So AL was used, uh, was start, I, used uh, I started to use it in Berlin. 
1960-61. Right up to Berlin. Yeah. Until 66, we could tell us the Achilles era. And one of the reasons, perhaps, was uh, because uh, uh, I thought it's better to give a special uh, uh, initial to each period. And then, as you see later on, with a Grombaum, uh, with, with a long way and my script, I didn't. And they had a signature on, on the window. And I started, I, I started to use Nazis when I began to uh, look at the theory of Lombard and Weber and so on. And so, uh, Thank, you. Thank you for Hello? sharing that. I am sure many of the audience are not aware of this part of the history. Now, you grew up in Kampong Glam in Singapore and lived here actually, which was then part of the British Malaya from 1949 to 1954. Did you ever imagine that one day, you know, you'll be going to school in Berlin and would travel throughout Southeast Asia and produce the series Pago Pago? Uh, never. I, uh... Uh, when I when, when 19, uh, 1954, when they sent me to summer, uh, to go to the uh, English school, I thought, uh, now I'm going for the order from the world. Because I can't hear you. Uh, and later on, what will happen? And then after Cambridge, uh, I was 1960. Suddenly, I, have, I was offered this uh, scholarship by the German uh, exchange student uh, exchange program to go to Germany for four years to study art. And, uh, and then uh, things happened one after another, you know, after Berlin, then I came back. Uh, and then I, I was in, uh, I was doing Pago Pago period, paintings in, 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 uh, in Thailand, everywhere, and so on. So, Things happen, and uh, my painting start rolling from then on, and that's it. So actually, it's very hard to predict also because these are we say it's fated to uh, to be painted a lot Thank This yeah. is a wonderful part of your journey from you know Berlin and then on to Southeast Asia. So clearly, there's a, a rich story behind the Pago Pago series. So if, my, yeah. if I may follow up with the questions for you, which is, you know, if, and can I have the producer put up a picture uh, of, of young Pak Latif? You know, if you were to meet yourself, right, this 12-year-old Pak Latif, known as the child protege today, you know, what would be your advice to him, to prepare him for the kind of journey that he's about to take on. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, a positive, uh, the older painter will advise the young painter. Uh, more or less, I will advise him. Like my elder artist advised me when I was small. That is uh, work hard, work very, very hard. And you, you focus on your work, you, 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 you concentrate on your work, and uh, you paint. Uh, paint with all your sensibilities, with all your faculties, with all your energy, your strength. And, uh, and time, at times, relentlessly, uh, uh, until your hands and your canvas burn. You know what I mean? So give all up. Total, total energy for your painting. That I will give to advice. This is also the advice I received from my elders in Singapore. Thank you for, for sharing so, so openly. Um, yeah. In your encounter with Uncle Wat in Siam Reap, you were struck by 
how you know it is the humans that constructed the wonderful temples, and yet it is the root and trunks of the trees that helped and prevented the structure from disintegrating over time. How has the idea of constructions and destructions influenced your art making process? Uh, uh, okay, there are two things. One is the nature itself. The, uh, the nature, uh, there, there's a, there's an idea that push and pull, pull and push. It's a, it is a yin yang. It's a, uh, two energy that is simultaneously in any parallel level working together. So, uh, as it was in Angkola, the nature was the, uh, the tree, the banyan roots. And uh, which is, uh, yeah, about it. And then we have the sculpture, the buildings, the ruins. And so most of them want to be, uh, to, to be, to be, to be alive in the center. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the big Ganyan tree has to go deep into the, uh, to the earth uh, for water. And the, uh, the winds uh, want to be, uh, to be there, uh, to be remembered uh, by the uh, by the uh, by the people. So most of them actually uh, cling to each other. They agree to stay to stay put. So it is a kind of balance that is uh, a two energy that are working together. And this is that is true in nature. And of course, uh, the uh, uh, it's not it's not good. The, the two uh, forces, the yin and yang, is not necessarily uh, an opposite. It, it for us is a uh, in Asia is more like uh, a complementary, where two forces working together to 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 exist, uh, to to do the level best. So uh, the, the, the the in my work, like the uh, how to say the, the creation itself. Uh, involve two things. Uh, you have to sometimes to uh, the big one has to be uh, the material. You have to sample the material and to to, uh, to make paintings. So creation that need some sort of a, uh, I won't say the word. I want to, I want to say the word destroy. But you you, you do in such a way that the two elements. Uh, Come together and make uh, a new creation. So uh, they are they are very useful. They are very uh, very 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 uh, useful to each other. Thank you. You have travelled uh, yeah. widely, and I think uh, that has always been part of your uh, practice. You identify yourself as a wanderer. You even spoke about how you detour to Kabul and to London, you know, on your way to New York in the early 70s. How do you channel that restlessness and that energy, you know, into the art of creation and, and painting, which is a journey you describe as silence and solitude? Uh, well, uh... This restlessness is partly because uh, uh, I, I am a Torontal when I travel, a wanderer. So it's always restless. <laughs> uh, you have to, uh, want to, you have always a chief fit, want to go to, to, to see uh, uh, what happened, uh, what is beyond the, beyond the hill, beyond the mountain, you will travel and so forth. But this is, uh, there is not, not only restlessness. We are talking about restlessness as an artist. Uh, you want some, you want to do something uh, great, but uh, sometimes the environment is not there. So you have to walk, uh, you have to travel uh, to other parts of the world so that there is, uh, you have more ideas. And so this travel is, uh, is a necessity. I think. Uh, to, to, for, as a, as an artist, to, to Thank you. Final questions for you. Yeah. 
You know, you're mostly uh, known as a painter to many of your fans, but you are also a writer. And can you describe for us, you know, when you paint or when you write, does this two form of artwork ever cross path? In other words, do you imagine the narrative of your writing when you paint? Or do you visualize the brush strokes of your painting when you write? No. Uh, I take one thing at a time. I, I, I don't mix this uh, two. When I paint, I paint totally just pigment. So uh, 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 I am trained to do total uh, painting. So, uh, it is a section fusion, you don't need to work to this kind of painting. So I don't, I don't, I don't uh, put words in my painting. Why versa when I write, uh, I don't illustrate them. Uh, because uh, uh, when two things got mixed, uh, the one, you know, more, more is less. <laughs> and, and you, you, so when I paint, I paint 100%. When I write hundred percent, so uh, there is no conflict there. It is just uh, the total energy for each genre. Parvatif, thank you so much for sharing, you know, uh, some of your more uh, intimate stories that we have not had to to, to a chance to hear previously. Uh, I shall now turn our questions to um, Rahel. Hi, Rahel. Hi, hello. As director, yes. as director of Ilham Gallery, can you share with the audience today who may not have visited Ilham Gallery, its origin and what it was set up you know, to accomplish? Sure. Well, Ilham is a public art gallery here in Kuala Lumpur. We opened our doors in August 2015. So we just celebrated our five-year anniversary I think we are the same age as NGS, maybe a couple of months older. Ilham is privately funded through the Ilham Foundation, but we operate very much as a public art space. We are open six days a week, admission is free, and we have a rotating series of exhibitions and public programs. Like many countries in the region, Malaysia does not have a strong museum infrastructure. We have a lot of private galleries and you know, artist spaces doing interesting things, but we lack institutional spaces. So that was one of the reasons why Ilham was set up, really to try and fill that gap to focus on scholarship and research and art education. So our exhibitions mainly focus on modern and contemporary art from Malaysia and the region. Since opening, we've had about 19 exhibitions from art historical ones, such as Love Me in My Bate, to more experimental projects, like the Ilham Contemporary Forum, where we invited seven young Malaysian curators to come and curate a show that looked at contemporary art and culture in Malaysia. And we've also collaborated with other institutions in the region, institutions like Singapore Art Museum, NUS Museum, NGS, of course, from Singapore, uh, Mayam in Chiang Mai and Parasite from Hong Kong. But I think what is really the core at Ilham, uh, what really sort of drives our work is education. At a time when, you know, art education seems to be in a going into a decline in Mal Malaysia and other places, education and public programming is really what connects us to our audiences. You know, where we can take some of the larger issues concerning art and society contained in our exhibition and real conversation. Uh, if I may go to the next questions, I think our survey sure. shows that uh, about 50% of our audience today have visited uh, Ilham uh, for the show Pago Pago when it was presented. Um, right. So maybe you can share a little bit more about the patronage model of a private institution like Ilham in supporting you know, artists in Malaysia or the region. Sure. Well, as we are non-commercial art space, I suppose the way we support artists is through our ability to provide a platform. 
that connects artists to Malaysian audiences. And I mean, we could do this through a number of ways. First, through the process of collecting. Secondly, through our exhibitions and also our publications. And thirdly, through art education. So over the last five years, we've really tried to create a space at Ilham where there can be real conversations about art and culture, where ideas can be tested, and where you know, there can be sort of real kind of critical dialogue between artists and audiences. So for example, during the three month long lockdown because of the COVID where Ilham and you know, every other man gallery was shut in Malaysia, we used our social media platform as a way to promote Malaysian art and Malaysian artists. So we ran weekly interviews with Malaysians that came out every week, sort of looking at their artistic practice and specific work that they have done. We also ran a project called the Artist Takeover Project, where basically we invited contemporary Malaysian artists to take over our Instagram account every weekend just using that platform so they could share, you know, the work they were doing, some of the inspiration behind their art, what they were doing in the studio, what they weren't doing in that studio, in the studio during that particular period of time. So it's, I suppose, having a kind of uh, engagement with our larger audience that we have. But of course, another way we can support artists is really through contributing to building the arts infrastructure here in Malaysia. We don't have enough curators and, art, and of course artists need, you know, you need curators and writers to write a work, to think about your work and to put your work in perspective. So we've been running quite a lot of workshops for emerging artists and curators from a, and a project that we're working on next with this is a project that is initiated by the Factory Contemporary Arts Center in Vietnam entitled pollination, which really seeks to support artist community and curator networks within Southeast Asia. So it's a way of building deeper relationships between artists and curators to facilitate more writing, more research log, which I think is something deeply needed in our region. Thank you. Maybe one, one more question for you, and then we'll move on to uh, yeah. Fu Hua. So maybe share with us how and why did you decide to present Park Latif's Pago Pago exhibition at Ilham? Well, in, I think it was in January 2018, uh, I had a meeting with uh, Eugene Tan, who's the director of NGS, and, and he brought up this idea about maybe bringing the Pago to Kuala Lumpur and having it at Ilham. And the exhibition hadn't yet opened at Pompidou, Paris, but, you know, we had we basically immediately agreed um, for a number of reasons, not least because Latif Mohedin occupies a really special place in the Malaysian art world, not only as one of our most celebrated visual artists, but also, you know, a leading poet, a thinker. And of course, the exhibition is historic, not just because Latif is Asian artist so at Pompidou, uh, to have a solo exhibition at, at, but also because this exhibition recognizes his contribution to global modernism. And the exhibition, of course, also gave us an opportunity to collaborate with National Gallery Singapore, gave us a chance to work with Palatif and uh, Mustafa. And, you know, at the end of it, we had a symposium, a wonderful symposium, where, you know, which brought together academics academics and thinkers from the region, including Gunawan Muhammad and Chakopati, and which really related uh, with Pat Latif reciting poetry, which was truly magical. And I'd just like to say that, you know, on behalf of the Ilham Foundation, uh, it was a real honor and privilege for us to be able to bring home this exhibition back to Kuala Lumpur and to share it with Malaysian audiences. Thank you. Maybe later on, I'll ask you some question about the response from the audience. But for now, uh, maybe sure. I should um, turn my attention to Fu Hua, who has been uh, patiently waiting for your turn. Thank you. Um, you are not only chairman of the gallery, rallying the management and staff you know, to deliver our vision, to inspire a creative, thoughtful, and inclusive society. You are also a patron of many local artists and artists in the region. 
So perhaps I should ask first, as the chairman of the gallery, what were your feelings when the exhibition curated by the gallery were you know, open to a global audience at Centre Pompidou? I remember it was a very cold evening. I think, was it winter, I think? And it was actually even snowing. Um, so you would expect uh, a chilly reception. But actually, as it turned out, uh, there were lots of, firstly, friends of uh, Latif who came all the way from Malaysia. I think there were at least, I, I don't know, 30 of them uh, or more. So his fan club came along. And so it was really a gathering of, uh, uh, you know, Southeast Asians to begin with. But there were also uh, many others uh, from, of course, uh, Paris. And uh, I recall, you know, looking at his art, one angle, and then you look the other way in the other angle, since it is situated next to the permanent gallery, you see the modern masters of uh, European art. And uh, so it was magical to see Latif side by side with the famous names that uh, you know, usually you dream about in any museum to have such a collection. So Latif clearly has uh, been placed right there in full recognition of Southeast Asian artists to sit side by side with uh, leading uh, you know, European names. Thank you. We understand that uh, during you know, your conversation with Pak Latif and Moose in Paris, you know, after the opening of Pago Pago at Centre Pompidou, you asked Pak Latif a very simple and yet fundamental question. Why is childhood important? And this actually has led to the publication of Half Craft, Half Art, uh, which is a collection of notes recalling Pak Latif's childhood in Singapore and a special element of the Pago Pago exhibition at the gallery. Could you share more with our audience why you think understanding Pak Latif's early years in Singapore was important to be included in the exhibition at the gallery? I, actually, when I was uh, told that I made this remark or I posed this question, I don't recall. Uh, but if I reflect on how I think and you know, explore, if I may use the word, I end up usually being quite probing. Sometimes that may be regarded as rude. Uh, and I think you already know it, right? Um, Kola, uh, working with me in the gallery, I have no end of questions. So this must be one of the many questions to Pak Latif. But to me, a childhood is very formative. So for me, my interest in art grew from childhood. So I was just curious. And furthermore, of course, uh, Pak Latif shared that he lived in Singapore. So I was curious as to what influence that had on, on him. And uh, then that's when I started learning about his uh, idea or rather the culture of Marantau, uh, which even fascinate, fascinated me more. And uh, a culture in rather unique to the Minangkabaus, where young children, well, I call, we call them children, but I think for Latif, probably he didn't think it was a child by the time he was asked to leave home. But nonetheless, in today's standard, uh, you know, someone at puberty will be regarded as child. And uh, Latif said that, you know, most of them are sent out. In fact, all of the male boys, are, all the boys are sent out. So now we're back again, but I gather you heard much of what I said. Uh, Palatif, uh, I was really fascinated with your account of uh, Marantau, and immediately uh, that gave me inspiration for the idea that we should explore your childhood even more. Um, yeah, so apologies for that uh, freeze frame earlier on. We are in the new world with uh, COVID affecting all of us. So, you know, in a live stream like this, uh, we do expect some technical difficulties. Uh, one final question for Fu Hua. Uh, as a patron of Pak Latif, you had the opportunity to visit him at his home and studio in Penang. How did such an encounter enhance your appreciation for Pak Latif's 
practice? No, first, I think my appreciation of Pat Latif as a person and in my encounters with art, of course, uh, it's a visual experience to begin with, uh, the art and myself. But usually I like to go beyond just looking at the art. I just like to know the person behind the art. And I was privileged uh, to be with Mustafa to make this first visit to uh, Latif's home. And I don't think Latif uh, receives many uh, people in his home, if I'm not wrong. So it's his uh, private space. It's his space for silence and solitude. But uh, you, we were privileged to encounter him. And you would think that actually for an artist who has all these modernist works, uh, you might think the home might be uh, more modern, but as it turned out, it was really a very traditional uh, Malay home, uh, full of uh, Malay architecture. Uh, so it was quite an interesting uh, merging of two worlds. So that reflects Pak Latif, who he is. He's able to merge many worlds, the modern, the traditional, the you know, East and the West, poetry and art. So an uh, extremely versatile man. And of course, needless to say, he was very uh, uh, hospitable. So more interesting for me was actually going right into his studio. It, we had to peel layers. You go into you know, the house before you... And I think you will need to know, he, he's got many houses in where he lives. It's a, it's a compound of houses. And entering the studio was the rewarding experience where we saw many of his works, uh, some half finished. And for me, I was fascinated by his sculpture in particular because I have not seen his sculpture before that. And that was, I think that explains why we have some of these uh, sculptures too here today, uh, rarely seen, uh, the, the, the plaster works. Thank you, Fuhua. Uh, we are now coming to the um, question and answer session segment of uh, this sessions. Uh, so for audience, if you do have questions for any of the panelists, uh, please do post your questions on the chat room and uh, we shall take your questions as we go along. Uh, we do have a questions that came in prior to uh, this particular session today, and it came from an assistant professor, uh, Mark Gloat. Actually, the question is for Pat Latif. Uh, he asked if Pat Latif could speak a little more about the experience uh, of his time in Berlin. In particular, uh, the impact of the crucial political changes. I think when you were in Berlin, within a year, the Berlin Wall came up, right? And so he would like you to share a little bit uh, about your experience you know, of that build up of the, 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 the Iron Curtain and uh, whether that encounter uh, did sort of influence your thinking and your work? Uh, Pak Latif, are you able to hear that question? It's frozen, I think. <laughs> yeah, he's not. Uh, someone should call him. You've got his phone. Okay, maybe <laughs> then I shall um, you know, ask a couple more questions uh, to Moose or uh, uh, Fuhua. Yeah, perhaps um, Moose, can you share you know, the audience response to the Pago Pago exhibition in Singapore? And I believe you also you know, visited the Ilham exhibition. And you how did her, actually. the uh, response from the Malaysian audience is different? Mm. And if Rahel is, can hear us, then maybe you can talk yeah. about the response from Malaysia. And then Moose yeah, can sure. talk about the response from Singapore. Please, Rahel. Sure. Um, well, there was a lot of excitement. Um, I think at the exhibition, we had about 500 guests in attendance which was one of our largest openings. Um, well, as I've said, occupies a very special place in the Malay 
Asian art world, strad straddling to the visual arts world and also lit literature and you know being a poet. Um, and I think also having that opportunity for many people, it was to see, you know, so many Pago Pago works all together in one space. I mean, there were many works that hadn't been in Malaysia for the last, I think, 50 years. So that was, you know, that was quite something. Um, and there was also a lot of excitement among the general public. Uh, we had a lot of visitors later on that who had never been to Ham and probably had never been to a gallery before, but there'd been so much media, you know, that had come out, a lot of articles in the Malaysian papers about this exhibition, Artif, you know, being the first Southeast Asian artist. Um, and so there was that real feeling of national pride that, you know, this Lati Mohedin is a Malaysian artist who had been given that honor. So it brought a lot of people who normally wouldn't come to Italy, brought it to the gallery, which was wonderful. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, I think every Malaysian who Latif Mohidin is should know his art and the contribution he has made to art mm -hmm. and culture in Malaysia. And Luz, what about the response in, uh, from Singapore audience? I mean, I think... Uh, Pak Latif is back. Oh, yes. Hi. Hi. Shall, I, sorry, shall I continue? Yes, yes. you should. Uh, no, we didn't hear you. We didn't hear you. Uh, you so didn't hear. why don't you let... Uh, yeah. Rest, your reply to the question, right? You are, yeah. You want to show the question? Uh, what was the question? Uh, but Latif, okay. the question was, you know, yeah. uh, whether your experience in Berlin, uh, how did it impact and influence your work, if any? Uh, well, uh, yeah, I'm not talking about the... Uh, the Berlin. Mr. about the Berlin Wall, Mr. the turbulence that uh, happened in Berlin when you, you know, first arrived in uh, in Germany. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I arrived uh, a year before the election of Berlin. Now, to point to answer whether there is an impact, uh, not directly, because I was an art student, and then uh, Berlin gave me opportunity to explore a lot of things and wanted to learn from the West, from the uh, from the world, uh, busy with the, uh, the, the, the to to learn as much as I could, and uh, of course there was uh, when uh, when I said that, there was a lot of news in the newspaper. Uh, people got stuck and they uh, you know in a, in a, in a, uh, what do you call it? in the wall now. Uh, it, there, there was uh, the only uh, anxiety I had of the uh, during those time was when I uh, traveled to East Berlin. Uh, this is before the before the election of the war. So what you did is just a piece of paper and they take uh, on Charlie. Then you went to uh, then you go to uh, East Berlin uh, uh, I, I, to buy books, maybe records and some uh, art material because they were cheaper, four times cheaper than uh, West Berlin. And then I had the opportunity to go to Humboldt, uh, to, to uh, Opera, Brex Theater and all that. And there was, uh, of course, uh, I went with my friend from South America. Of course, we were being followed <laughs> by the East, uh, Eastern uh, you know, police. And, uh, and then later, the other, time that I feel anxiety about this, uh, the regime was, you know, I had little money, so I had to travel by train from the zoo to, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to, to, to the border. And the, uh, the, this was a special train for the forest, for foreigners, it's sealed, and uh, no, no way you can uh, run, uh, go down to the station. So the whole journey is like a, Tunnel, and is when we arrive in the Mall or Dowitz, the only way we are able to go out. Uh, no, directly there is no influence, and also of course later uh, when I went to uh, when I went to uh, Indochina to travel, uh, I was aware that there was a war going on. You know, there.
the Piat Kong, the Patet Lao, and, 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 and all uh, the, the, uh, the, the Islam at the time. But I was traveling, so I just passed through. Maybe I walked on a, a restricted area, I didn't know. And so uh, there, is, there is no impact in my uh, work directly because I feel abstract and uh, they, they, they not so much of a social or political thing. And, but of course, in some of them, uh, it did come up, the, the anxiety of this, you know, of this uh, surrounding like uh, Mecca River and all that. I hope I answer your question, Prof. Yes, thank you, Pak Latif. I, I think this is one of the rare opportunity for our audience to hear, you know, so much uh, history that was being shared by Pak Latif with all of us and with his generous sharing. Realizing that it's yeah. uh, we're three minutes past five, thank so you. before so. Uh, we end this session, I would like to invite Moose actually to introduce a artwork that is, you know, part of the Pago Pago exhibition presented at the gallery. The exhibition will end um, 27 September, so for all of you who have yet to come and see the exhibition, or even if you have already seen it now with the new knowledge that you've just gained, you might see it with a different perspective. So uh, I, I will ask Moose to actually talk about this particular art artwork, the two standing figures. Thanks, Kola. Um, 1968, the year when uh, this painting is made, um, is really uh, quite um, critical um, in the sense that um, it is a work that is uh, painted uh, as Pag Latif had returned to Bangkok. And uh, of course, you know, 1968 is a complex moment uh, for Southeast Asia, right? Uh, partly also because uh, things like the Vietnam War are taking off and there's all sorts of things, uh, stirrings. But it is also the year when um, Pago Pago finds a newer place again uh, in the Bangkok newspapers. And uh, this work in particular has, as a result, been debated and discussed. Uh, quite extensively by the critics uh, and the art historians who are trying to make sense of what this image is uh, to, 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 to begin with. And uh, rather than breaking down this particular image um, along very formal lines, uh, perhaps um, I could uh, end um, uh, my note on this work by reading something uh, that Pak Latif narrated <laughs> to me recently uh, in relation to the year 1968, right? And uh, this is a text uh, from the catalog that we have published in conjunction with the Pompidou exhibition. And uh, so allow me uh, to read. I think it'll take about a minute. So this is an entry called 1968. I always traveled alone to continue that urge for curiosity. What lies behind the hill, this border? The urge to travel became a sort of obsession. You hit the road and that's it. What happens will happen. The most important thing being that you are always on the move. I learned a lot in between. How to become minimalist in everything. <clears throat> you eat little, sleep little. You desire to reach the next point, even if you have had become distracted along the way. And then you find your destination. But the destination is not what you expected. The reality outmeasures your understanding. And besides that, you need patience to wait for the bus, for the driver who takes so long to sip his coffee and change tires. We are all in the bus. How many minutes must you wait before we set off? And then you find out it's the wrong bus. <laughs> Somebody asked me, Latif, where did you get the money to travel? I cannot recall. I was not selling my paintings. It is one of those mysteries of life. Just had enough to go from one point to another. And so this is in recollection of 1968, um, the year this painting is made. Thank you. You know, do support the gallery 
as you know, donor and exhibition patrons, so that curator like Moose can continue uh, to conduct important research to further the understanding of art from Southeast Asia and allow the gallery you know, to present great art from this part of the world to a global audience. So with that, let me thank not just your participation today. We, I know that there are still other questions that is unanswered. We will go to the chat room and we'll hopefully be able to respond to them separately. But let me first thank um, Pak Latif Mohidin, who joined us you know, from Penang, in, from his studio. A little plug for him. The painting behind him is what? his latest work. I don't know the title <laughs> of the work yet. <laughs> We'd also like to thank yeah. our guest from KL, our panel from KL, Rahel. And if you have not you. been to the gallery, please go visit Ilham Gallery. And obviously we need to acknowledge uh, patrons of the artists, but also chairman of the gallery, Jia Fu Hua. And of course, without all the wonderful research done by Moose, and in collaborating with other curators, uh, you know, in Sandra Pompidou and with Rahel, uh, this exhibition would not have been possible. So again, if you have not seen this exhibition, please do come see it before it ends next Sunday. And if yeah. you, before you leave us, if you have any comment, any uh, things that you'd like to share with us, uh, please use the chat room, share your thoughts uh, before uh, you leave this session. And we hope that we will continue to be able to bring sessions like this, you know, so that we can bring you much closer to the artists, the curators, the patrons, as well as arts institutions. Thank you so much for your participation today. Goodbye now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.